the University of Rochester Medical Center from 2017 to 18. While a resident, Dr. Srinivasan also received the Linda Spillane Resident Teaching Award and the Ryan P. Bodkin Award for Clinical Excellence. Dr. Srinivasan completed his fellowship in neurocritical care within the Department of Neurology and Rehab Medicine at the University of Cincinnati in June of 2020. During fellowship, Dr. Srinivasan worked as an attending physician and clinical instructor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Cincinnati, as well as Mercy Health. He served on the University of Cincinnati stroke team. He's recognized as an excellent instructor and distinguished clinician of emergency medicine. Dr. Srinivasan is dividing his clinical time between the Harborview Emergency Department and the Neurocritical Care Unit. We're excited to have him as part of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Washington and critical care teams and are looking forward to his lecture titled Guardians of the CPP. Thank you. Wow, thanks. Uh, that's, that sounds like a really impressive background for somebody. I can tell you the real guy is probably not even remotely as uh, interesting as the person you just described. Um, so for uh, everyone I haven't had the opportunity to work with or meet in person, uh, my name is Fashi and uh, one of the EM, new EM faculty and uh, neurointensivists. And can everyone hear me? Yes, sounds great. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, I uh, wanted to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to kind of talk about something that I am very uh, interested and passionate about. And uh, hopefully uh, you guys will get a better sense of the other half of my world uh, and uh, learn a, a little bit about what we do upstairs and kind of excite some people into neurocritical care if uh, this is what your passion is as well. Uh, so I'm not even remotely important enough to have any interesting disclosures, but I am gonna be talking about some uh, off-label stuff and uh, there are some industry supplied figures and data here uh, as well. So uh, today's agenda, we'll talk about what exactly neurocritical care is and why it's, uh, why it's important for EM docs, especially to have a, at least a cursory understanding of some principles of neurocritical care and uh, uh, why it's important uh, to set patients up for success in the emergency department. Uh, and if this sounds like something that you're interested in, we'll talk a little bit about how uh, you can get into it uh, as a resident as well. Um, so, this is supposed to be somewhat interactive, so please do not make me talk for 30 minutes or 45 minutes because uh, I will bore myself if I do that. Uh, so please ask questions. Please type things into the chat and, and, uh, uh, and kind of make this a little bit more interactive uh, as much as you can on Zoom. So uh, go ahead and uh, take a couple seconds, and I I'm curious to see what people think of when they hear neurocritical care and, and kind of what their impressions are of the field and what your experiences are working with the neurocritical care service here at uh, Harborview. Don't everyone type all at once. Anybody? Awesome. Okay. So we got some acute strokes, brain bleeds, NCCS puts in orders. Love it. Yep. Uh, always important to get your people out of the department as soon as you have identified uh, a disposition. And uh, sad cases. Yes. Uh, we'll talk about that also. So uh, perfect. Um, well, if you go to the Neurocritical Care Society's website, uh, the kind of official definition is a multidisciplinary field uh, that treat a wide range of neurological, uh, neurocritical care, neurosurgical conditions. Um, and kind of these are the hallmarks of things uh, that we treat. Uh, and within the last year, uh, getting money from uh, federal organizations to create this campaign called the Curing Coma Campaign. And, and while that sounds patently ridiculous when you first hear about it, what the point of this is to kind of do more research and dedicate more resources to identifying causes, etiologies of coma, and try to help people with it. This was kind of spurred on by uh, Jan Claussen's work in the New England Journal of Medicine last year that showed EEG reactivity in patients who were clinically diagnosed as being in a coma. What that means, we have absolutely no idea, but it was fascinating enough that people are still talking about it. Uh, so 
when you really think about the things that we do upstairs, um, this is kind of my cursory list of sort of broader themes of, of what we do. Um, and when you really look at this, a lot of this stuff is well within the wheelhouse of emergency medicine, right? I mean, this is, this is stuff we do all the time in the ED, seizure management, airway management, hemodynamic management. I mean, this is all the stuff that we do. Uh, even post-stroke care, every time you put a head of the bed up, every time you titrate a, a ventilator to make sure a PCO2 is within target range, and that's all post-stroke care. Uh, anytime you keep someone as simple as NPO after a stroke, that's stroke care. Um, and so it's essentially the principles of good critical care to take care of patients who are neurologically ill and injured. Or put in another way, if your brain is broken, neurocritical care can help. Uh, so I want to go over some cases, and the point of this is not to kind of teach you guys neurocritical care through cases, but I want especially the, some of the more junior residents who are listening to this to get a sense of what, how would I approach this case if this showed up in my emergency department? Or if I'm the trauma doc, or if I'm the person who's primarily responsible for this, how would I go through this? And how do I think about this patient? Um, I'm not going to give you guys the what happened to these people because that's less relevant than the actual thought process of thinking about how you would manage this, these people because these are complex patients that have a lot of issues going on. So for the purposes of this, you are the overnight trauma doc, and EMS rolls in at 2 a.m. with a transfer. Uh, and I'm not going to read my slides, uh, but I'll let you guys read the EMS report that I got. This was a case I had of all times, um, I think it was Christmas of last, this past year, was when this uh, patient arrived in the unit. So uh, we did direct admits uh, in Cincinnati um, and in residency and in, in here, this patient would arrive into the ED first. So this is what you get. And, uh, you know, show of hands if you've ever gotten a report like this from EMS. So essentially, 59-year-old woman found down, intubated at outside hospital, got a CT scan which showed some blood in her head, started uh, dropping her pressure. So they started levo, getting harder to ventilate, going up on pressors, and oh, by the way, she's got a 22 in the rest. Peace out. Uh, this is something that we, we hear all the time. So you walk into the room, you see this patient, she looks terrible. You look up at the monitor and that's what you see. Anyone terrified by this monitor yet? I'm gonna assume people are nodding. Uh, and then you look over at the ventilator and this is the screen that you get. Uh, peak pressuring, low minute ventilations, and uh, vent settings that are largely just kind of set and forget. Uh, somebody helpfully pulls up her head CT and this is what you see. So a selected slice. Uh, and for those of you who have looked at uh, scans like this, uh, you know that this is the crab of death or for some people, it's the starfish of death, or for some people, and I, I don't understand this at all, but some people are insist on calling it the chicken of death. I don't see a chicken there, but that's just me. Um, but regardless, there's a couple of uh, points on here besides the obvious amount of blood uh, that are worth mentioning, and that you see her temporal horns on the CT scan. That's not normal for a 59-year-old. Um, and while 59 is a little older, uh, it, it's not, you're not supposed to have as much atrophy as you would in your 70s or 80s to see that. Um, common problem after uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, also, her midbrain's a little dusky. It's a relatively hypo-intense compared to the rest of the brain. And that, that's an important point, as, as we'll bring up later. And then, obviously, she's got the gigantic hemorrhage within her gyrus rectus uh, up front. Uh, so all kind of pointing to, this is not, again, this is not uh, a case that's designed to make you kind of guess what it is. She obviously has an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, and when you actually scan through the uh, CTA, I apologize for the shaky cam. Uh, at some point, you will actually see some aneurysms. And so I'll show you guys the, uh, the slides that matter. Uh, and so she clearly has a, a multi-lobe basilar tip aneurysm. Um, and again, those who have been doing this for a while should recognize that that doesn't make sense. You should not have a large amount of blood up front with a basilar aneurysm. You can, but it's a little odd. Uh, so when you look at the 3D reconstructions of the angio, I don't know what out outside hospital this is, but they came, this lady came with uh, uh, 3D reconstructions off of her high slice uh, CT angio. So it's so clearly a well-staffed uh, 
well-resourced sex ed hospital. Um, and the key, the key point here is that when you zoom into the uh, 3D reconstruction, you actually see a second aneurysm uh, that's right on the anterior communicating artery. And that was actually the culprit lesion. And that's why she bled. So the neuroanatomy aside, let's look at some labs. These are the labs from the ED at the Edsted Hospital. Anyone find anything concerning here that they, uh, that they maybe want to address or look at? Yeah, her VBG is pretty concerning. Right, VBG is a little concerning. Um, she's got a little bit of an AKI. Her lactate's up. Her sugars are over 500. Uh, her white count's 32. So this is, these are all con very concerning labs. And those are the labs that we got from the outside hospital ED. Took her about an hour to fly over to us at the university hospital from there. So uh, this was her chest x-ray that was shot. Uh, Anyone see anything concerning here? Of the fact that she has a, she had a previous sternotomy. So take a look at that x-ray, think about what you find on it. Uh, and you then decide to put the ultrasound probe on her chest and other than the very poor windows that she had, uh, you see on these two windows, I hope you guys can see these videos, but uh, her heart's okay, but it, it's, it's not contracting as much as you would expect it to contract. And you really see this on the four chamber where the apex, if you really look closely, the apex isn't moving um, and it's kind of ballooned out a little bit. So uh, you then move over to her lungs. You see this on her pulmonary ultrasound. Uh, and for those who don't know what this is, this, these are B lines uh, everywhere. Uh, and, you know, obviously you take a look at your Mark one eyeballs and you look at her ET tube and that's what you see when uh, you look at her ET tube and her circuit. So clearly this woman has some pretty bad pulmonary edema. Um, so to summarize all of her problems, she has an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, she's hypoxemic, she's acidotic, she's got a component of neurogenic pulmonary edema, likely some component of cardiogenic shock, probably from Takasuba's cardiomyopathy. And we can debate back and forth about whether this qualifies as ARDS. Neurogenic pulmonary edema is a uh, cause of ARDS, but with the heart issues, you can kind of debate back and forth about whether that's true ARDS. Regardless, um, this is the interactive portion. What are you gonna do? These are your choices. Uh, and this is one of those situations where there's no one right answer, but it's kind of based on your interpretation. So if we can get the poll put up. Uh, what are you, what are folks going to do? Um, think about you're managing this patient. It's your patient. You're standing in front of them at 2 a.m. and you got to make a decision. So we have 39 people. Um, how many responses do you want before we close the poll? We're at about um, no. 20, something like, at least, at least about 20 to 30. Okay. It'd be nice to get a nice sampling to, to see really what people would, and there's no right answer, folks. Um, if you want to panic and change your scrubs, by all means, please do. That, that's a totally acceptable answer. We've got 23 now. Looks like they're still coming in, so we'll give it another few seconds. Cool. Okay, so last 10 seconds to get your answer in. Okay, we're going to close now and show. All right, so most people want to fix the ventilator. Um, a couple of people are going to panic. That's okay. A couple of people want to call ECMO. Uh, a couple of people just want her out of the department and admit her. Totally reasonable. A couple of people want to titrate pressors. Uh, and only 15% want a COVID swab. I was, I'm surprised more people aren't uh, concerned about that. But uh, anyway, uh, so, you know, it is to for, for the interns and junior residents who are terrified by this case, 
it is okay to be scared. This is a very uh, seriously ill patient. It is okay to be terrified. Um, just remember from back in the day, if you haven't read House of God, please do. It is a fantastic, fantastic book. Uh, and even though it was written in the 70s, I, I swear 80 to 90% of it is still true. Um, or just watch Scrubs. It's probably just as uh, just as accurate. Um, and you know, if you haven't read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, also an excellent uh, textbook to read that's non-medical. Um, but in the intensive care unit, a towel is less useful, and, and this is my own personal talisman against evil in, in the critical care unit. Um, less useful for this patient, uh, but anyway, it is important, regardless of what you do, to have some sort of plan. Um, and that's really what the point of this is you have a patient with multiple issues all happening at the same time, driven by a primary neurologic insult. And you got to, you got to start somewhere. You got to fix something and move on to the next thing and just go one at a time. Um, and so it's really a lot of competing interests though, right? So who are you calling for help? What are you going to fix first? And what are your endpoints of resuscitation? And then especially in neurocritical care, one of the things we always have to stop and ask ourselves is what are, what are we doing? What's her overall progress? Regardless of what we do, what is she going to look like uh, in six months from now? Uh, so, you know, this is my little plug to say, don't forget the joint commission metrics. Uh, you know, her white counts elevator, her lactate's elevated, her blood pressure is low. Uh, anyone giving this woman 30 cc's per kilo plus antibiotics. Uh, and if you're thinking about this, the answer is no, please, please don't do that. that. That's a very, very bad idea. Uh, to give this woman that much fluid. Um, if you want an antibiotic, sir, no one's going to fault you for doing that. Uh, so which problem do you fix her first? Um, do you fix the hypoxemia while you work on the blood pressure? Do you fix the blood pressure? How do you do this as you start going up on her PEEP? You, know, you could, in theory, affect ICP, and this woman already has hydrocephalus. So these are complex decisions where you can't just start flipping switches, and every decision you make and every... Uh, act you take can actually have serious consequences to the patient. Um, so it's worth taking a couple seconds to take a deep breath and think about how you're going to proceed. Um, you call it neurosurgery for help. Some people wanted to have neurosurgery come by, put a ventric in and get this woman out of there. Absolutely. Uh, but there's still a lot of work that we have to do before this woman can leave. And with current boarding issues, she's probably not leaving the department for a little while anyway. Uh, pharmacy for all the cool drugs. Yeah, you want a pharmacy next to you. You want your ED pharmacy, your critical care pharmacy uh, right next to you because you're going to be titrating drips. You're going to be giving her uh, drugs. You're going to be starting uh, epiprostanol. Uh, you're going to uh, be doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Get your folks with you. Um, you call in these folks for an ECMO consult. Uh, I'm sure they would be happy to answer your phone call even at 2 a.m., but think about if she really is a candidate. Are you really going to cannulate this woman who looks like this? The uh, point is, assemble your team early, get everyone that you need, get your resources next to you for someone this critically ill, uh, and set yourself up for success. And so, you know, as you start kind of going through the problems in your head, you're going to try to balance her ARDS with her hypoxic brain injury, plus her cardiogenic shock, plus her ICP issues. Where do you want her map to be? Um, you know, Europeans use 180 as your target for aneurysms. People here use 120. Uh, the national organizations recommend 140. So pick your blood pressure target. Uh, where are you going to keep her PaO2? Are you going to keep her over 55? LOCO2 suggests 80. Are you going to be able to get her that high? She's got a hypoxic injury to her brain. You want her higher. So you know, how, what trade-offs are you going to make? Uh, where are you going to keep her PCO2? Uh, she's got clear ICP issues. She's also got ARDS. We've got competing interests here. Um, quick show of hands. I don't want to spend too long on this. Anyone starting inhaled nitric or starting inhaled epiprostanol? If you don't know what any of those are, that's okay. Uh, but just think about that. Um, how about some Lasix? Anyone, give, anyone giving this woman Lasix? Okay. Are we going to switch her to APRV? You got a little bit of work to, left to do on the ventilator, but uh, you know, think about that. Are you going to prone this woman? She's got, you know, ARDS. Are you going to prone her? Can you even do that? She's a little too early for Proceva, and she's got some ICP issues, right? Uh, anyone called? We talked about an ECMO consult. I mean, her Murray score is is high. Her save score is high, so she definitely qualifies. But 
are you going to be able to anticoagulate this woman? Absolutely not. So these are all considerations to think about as you're managing one problem. She's got other issues that kind of weigh into that, which is kind of the hallmark of neurocritical care, actually. Um, and then, as I said, what's her overall prognosis, right? This is always in the back of our head for neurocritical care. Um, you know, we want to make sure we give everyone a chance to recover, but there are some people that regardless of what we do are not going to have a meaningful neurologic recovery. And it's important uh, to be honest with families about that, but it's also important to give people time. Uh, so the single most important question in all of the neuroscience, clinical neurosciences, and this is a question that if you work with me with a neuro patient, I'm going to ask you this, is what is her exam? Uh, and we kind of fixate on ABCs, which are important because ABCs are absolutely the most important things you should focus on in this patient. But while you are having, while your respiratory therapist is uh, messing with your ventilator, while you have someone else doing an ultrasound, while you have someone else, your pharmacist is helping you set up your uh, epi drip or your dibutamine drip, you can do your exam. You can have one of your colleagues do an exam for you and get a sense of what is this patient's neurologic status. Uh, and this is her actual neurologic exam. She's comatose. She doesn't uh, respond. She's intubated. Her pupils are fixed and non-reactive. He has no corneal VOR cough, but she is triggering breaths on the ventilator. As you can see based on her flow curves. Uh, and she's weakly extensor posturing when you pinch her axillary fat pad. Uh, I do want to point out, this is one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, there is no GCS listed in her mental status. That is not a neurologic exam. Please do not use the GCS as a surrogate for your neurologic exam. Um, and so you either remember this, remember this talk, remember your time with uh, neurocritical care, and you want to figure out what is her prognosis and what, what is her uh, outcome here. And you look at something called the Hunt-Hess classification. And because she's comatose and posturing, MD calc says that she has an approximate 90% mortality rate. Um, the original data would have in the uh, I want to say 60s or 70s would have suggested she had a uh, 100% mortality rate. Even if you put the ventriculostomy in, this woman's probably not going to do well regardless. Uh, but it's never 100%. Um, and so, you know, when you think about her overall prognosis, her Hunt has score, it's, it's bad. Uh, her prognosis, she has an 80 to 100% chance of dying in the next 30 days. Uh, is it too soon? Yeah, but you also don't want to paint a rosy picture to the families and say, oh, yeah, she's going to be fine. We just got to fix a bunch of stuff. Uh, it's important to be honest to families, even early on. Um, and you don't want to create self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, if you start looking into things like the ICH score, you see people with bad ICH scores have high mortality rates. But because of that, people tend to withdraw care on patients with high ICH scores. So it kind of it's a little bit of a circular logic. Um, and so you want to avoid making decisions just based on a single metric or a single score. Um, you know, you do, and you don't really need to prognosticate in the emergency department, but it is important to have honest conversations and be very realistic with families about how sick people are. Um, and so the takeaway point from this case I want you to have is neurocritical care patients can look fine and then crash on you in a moment's notice. And so have a plan, execute, and don't be afraid to call for help. Um, there's plenty of resources around and uh, don't be afraid to phone a friend if you need it. Um, so let's uh, go through another case real quick. Uh, so you have a 54 year old woman uh, with a witness seizure. Uh, EMS gets called, she gets two hits of Ativan en route. Um, and as you get the call, you're asking, you know, what else is going on? And then they roll into recess 3-1 and she's still seizing. Uh, and you're gowning up because we don't know her COVID status and all that. And EMS says she's gotten eight of Ativan and they're running into Gramma Kepra, right? This is pretty standard. We see this not infrequently. Um, so what are folks going to do with this woman? Just to quickly summarize, 54-year-old woman got eight of Ativan, still seizing, Grandma Capra's running in. What are people gonna do? So ABCs, obviously you're gonna do all those things, but from a kind of neuro standpoint, how are you gonna manage this woman's seizures? Okay, so we've got some uh, 
So this is your airway, propofol, time for propofol, prepare to intubate, get next gen, get next agents ready. Yep, absolutely. So uh, if you think back to uh, about eight years ago now at this point, Rampart came out uh, and looked at uh, midazolam versus IV Ativan in the field and showed uh, efficacy. So if you don't have an IV, 10 of midazolam IM works just as well as uh, eight of uh, Ativan split over two doses. And then ESET just came out last year. If you haven't had a chance to read ESET, I highly recommend that you actually read the, the actual paper. The uh, FOMED blogs have a lot of comments and a lot of things to say about it, but read the actual primary literature and uh, kind of make your conclusions for yourself. But this was kind of the New England Journal is now putting out these visual graphics because I guess we all have the attention span of a doorknob. So uh, basically says that none of these drugs are particularly good. Um, they're all equally bad at terminating status epilepticus. Uh, but any of these choices are probably fine. Um, if you're comfortable using phosphenetone, uh, you know, use it. If you're comfortable using Keppra, use it. Uh, but if you're going to use Keppra, please dose it appropriately. The ESET dose for status epilepticus uh, was 60 milligrams per kilogram with a max dose of four and a half grams. So if you do the math, the gram of Keppra that we all used to give back in the day uh, is actually only efficacious and the correct dose for established status if you weigh about 17 kilos. Um, and for reference, this this is the weight of your average countertop microwave. So if you've got some of the size of a microwave sitting in front of you, absolutely give them a gamma crepera. For literally everybody else, um, you know, the Pacific Northwest tends to be a little healthier than the Midwest, but all of our larger patients in the Midwest uh, needed significantly more than one gram of crepera at a time. So uh, whatever way you do this, if you know, if you want to give, uh, with the ESET, the protocol was you push the drug over 10 minutes and you give them a chance. And then if they continue to have convulsions, you then proceeded to intubate. Otherwise, you kind of waited and, and saw what happened. Uh, we can talk, if you're interested in, in learning more about ESET, uh, feel free to message me uh, and we can chat about it more offline. Uh, so the takeaway point, if you're going to use a drug, use dose it appropriately. Don't give someone half a drug. Don't give them someone a uh, subtherapeutic dose of a drug. Um, so know the drugs that are used and kind of, and please dose them appropriately. You would never give someone a half dose of a baby aspirin for a heart attack. So uh, anyway, one more, um, and then we'll kind of switch gears a little bit. Uh, so this is a 19 year old, uh, intoxicated patient, I didn't put the gender in, but obviously a guy because women are smarter than this, uh, runs headfirst into a brick wall. Uh, and he's awake and talking for EMS when they arrive uh, and then declines as he shows up to the emergency department. Um, people, uh, people's are asymmetric. We'll talk about what NPIs are, but asymmetric and sluggish. Uh, and so you're at the head of the bed, you are getting your airway stuff set up, and what are you worried about when you're intubating this patient? All right, so we've got uh, ICP, acidemia, transient hypoxemia, C-spine, absolutely all of those things. But come on, folks, no one mentioned COVID. Very disappointed. <laughs> um, so yes, all of those things that you guys mentioned. So the key is with anybody with traumatic brain injury, the, the point is to avoid secondary brain injury. So uh, a single episode of CPP less than 60 will increase your mortality by almost fourfold. Um, and patients who have neurologic deterioration, uh, which occur in a quarter of the patients, regardless of what we do, can increase your mortality fivefold. Uh, so this is a really big deal. Uh, and this has been studied extensively. Uh, lots, of lots of patients with TBI have hypotension. TBI in and of itself makes you coagulopathic. Uh, lots of patients have increased ICP. They all have autoregulatory dysfunction. So this is a big deal from a neurophysiologic standpoint. And so the key points here are to avoid hypotension. You want to keep your systolics up as much as you possibly can. Um, this is always the competing interest between uh, neurocritical care and trauma and general uh, surgical critical care is you've got someone with a uh, grade three splenic lack that you're watching in the unit that also has a bad TBI with the Bolton. You got to keep their blood pressures up for CPP. But if that spleen pops because your pressures are 140, that's not ideal either. So 
Um, it's, a, it's a big deal for these multiply injured patients. Um, also avoid, avoid hypoxia. If you have bad pulmonary contusions and traumatic ARDS, that's a really hard problem. Uh, those patients are very, very sick. Uh, obviously, you want to correct your ICPs. Um, harder to do in the ED if you don't have an ICP monitor, but since Dr. Chestnut is on staff here, I hope everyone actually has read this trip, uh, which demonstrated that you don't need an ICP monitor to actually uh, get a sense of what the patient's ICP is. You can do that based on CT scan and exam alone. Um, and obviously, the volume resuscitate people. Um, and to the right of the slide is probably the single most important uh, image of all of neurocritical care. Uh, and it has to do with the autoregulatory cascade. And this is the concept of as your blood pressure varies, your cerebral blood flow stays constant because your, the astrocytes in your brain will autoregulate your vascular tone. Uh, there is really not much in terms of any uh, alpha receptors on uh, intracranial arterioles. So this is how your brain does it, uh, which is pretty ingenious. And so it redirects blood flow to uh, parts of the brain that really need it. Uh, but in the setting of trauma, this relationship goes away and uh, becomes a linear relationship where increases in mean arterial pressure will actually increase cerebral blood flow regardless and cause ICP issues as well. Uh, and so this is a big deal where you can't let your patients get too hypertensive, but at the same time, you don't want them hypotensive either. So it's all about that Goldilocks principle of finding that right blood pressure that's going to uh, support them while they recover. Um, and in terms of clinical signs, uh, keep in mind that your patients in the recess bay may have these signs of herniation. If you see ionized choria, you see a dilated or non-reactive pupil, if they have a neurologic decline by more than two GCS points, they're posturing, these are things that should make you very concerned about an ICP issue. Uh, and the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines actually say you shouldn't empirically give hypertonic saline or mannitol. Uh, to patients uh, without a monitor, but if they do show signs of intracranial hypertension, that that's an indication to go ahead and give that. Um, hypertonic saline is probably, based on the most recent data, better than mannitol, but that's a conversation to have with your surgeons and your intensivists. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with NPI and pupillometry, um, feel free to come upstairs to the second floor. We have these machines upstairs and uh, happy to show you how to uh, play with this. But the point is that this is an objective measurement of pupil size because we suck at estimating pupil size. Um, you know, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but we all know how good we are looking at a patient's eyes and saying, oh, they're two millimeters. Oh, these are pinpoint or these are four millimeters, right? I mean, we're, we're kind of making this up. The OB guides are better at measuring, measuring cervix size than we are at... Uh, measuring uh, pupil size. Um, so this is an objective way with high inner rate reliability of what the pupil actually is. And the NPI or neurologic pupillometry index is a measure of how reactive the pupil is. And again, it's subjective, right? Because you say, oh, these pupils are briskly reactive. What does that mean? These pupils are sluggish. What does that mean? This one person's sluggish could be another person's brisk. Um, and so with objective data, you get these numbers uh, and anything above four is essentially normal uh, and anything above a three we're okay with. Uh, and these are the screens that you see. You actually get a little dot and uses image recognition to figure out where the pupil is and it tracks the pupil as it shines a light to figure out what the maximum and minimum diameter is, what the speed of constriction is and uh, gives you all this data that you can track. And this actually gets uh, charted in ORCA so you can trend over time. Um, and so, again, from an ED standpoint, the point here is a single episode of hypoxia or hypotension versus mortality in TBI. So please do not get your, let your patients get hypoxemic. Do not let them get hypotensive. These may not be difficult airways from an anatomic standpoint, but they are definitely physiologically challenging airways because you need to maintain that perfusion of the brain at all times. So uh, now that you know, uh, if this sounds like your particular brand of vodka and you want to do this or you want to uh, make this part of your career, uh, this section is for you. Uh, the, somebody had mentioned before that this was a, an intense field or uh, these were sad cases, and that's absolutely true. Uh, neurocritical care is not a happy field by any means. Um, you know, every neurointensivist, myself included, has a graveyard of patients who have died despite our best efforts. Uh, with the heroin epidemic, uh, we see far too many very, very young patients who come in uh, after a bad overdose with hypoxic brain injury. And, and that is an unfortunate uh, consequence of the opiate crisis that we're currently in. Uh, and 
you know, the uh, we, you know, we can have a discussion about uh, the availability of firearms at another uh, time, but you know, we see way too many people with GSWs to the head that have fatal injuries. Uh, so this is a, this is not a happy field, but what's worse is that there are fates that are worse than death in neurocritical care. Uh, Locked-in syndrome is the perfect example where you are awake and conscious but have no motor control. Uh, people who are young, hemiplegic and aphasic, uh, and you can't communicate, uh, that's you know, a big deal. Uh, and you know, we use the modified Rankin score listed here for outcomes after TBI and after any major neurocritical care illness, um, stroke, that sort of thing. Uh, and if you really look at it, there's a reason why uh, that a good outcome is generally listed as a modified Rankin of zero to two in most of these stroke studies. A lot of them are even zero to one uh, because zero is no symptoms, you know, so no significant disability, you can still carry out all your usual activities. Um, and bad outcomes largely are five or six. Um, but really the big delta here is a three to four. Um, mo a, a modified ranking of three means that your family can go to dinner, your family can go to the grocery store and leave you at home by yourself. A modified ranking of four means they can't leave and you need 24 seven supervision. So. Uh, you know, kind of imagine your life and think about that uh, and how how that affects your individual family members if, God forbid, something happened to you or one of your loved ones. Uh, you know, these are all things that we think about, and these are the conversations that we have with families about how do we get their care set up and what does rehab look like and what is their outcome and what, are, what do we think are going to happen to folks. Um, having said that, it's not all doom and gloom, and the wins that we get, uh, even though they're not that many of them, they are completely completely worth doing. Um, and these are a couple of wins that we've had over the last several years. Uh, you know, the, uh, as an example, the 55-year-old man was working near a power line in a shed, accidentally hit the power, dropped after electrocuting himself, son was working with him, had immediate hands-on chest, got ROSC from paramedics, and he walked out of the hospital. His, his wife cried when he woke up and started following commands. Uh, you know, one of my good friends from uh, medical school had an ACOM rupture and he got his PhD in neuroscience. Uh, so these happen with aggressive good critical care. Uh, and the photo that you see there is a patient of mine who uh, gave me permission to use it in this talk that uh, he had a right frontal AVM rupture, uh, was herniating, we decompressed him, fixed the AVM and had months of critical care in the ICU and in rehab, got traked and pegged and all that. And his wife sent me uh, a photo of them dancing at their anniversary. So it's, it's a big deal when, when we can help patients recover and have some meaning in their life after. Uh, and in the public world, there are quite a few other success stories. And uh, Amelia Clark's actually uh, using her story as a way to kind of inspire patients with brain injury and brain trauma to try to help people who have sustained uh, devastating injuries. Uh, and so it, it, it happens, even though we are t tend to be a, a doom and gloom field, we do have wins and we do have successes that make it completely worthwhile. Um, so Captain America can say it way, way, way better and more eloquently than I can, but you know, you can't save everyone, but you focus on the people that you can save uh, as much as you can and uh, you have to live with the ones that you can't save. You know, the eight-year-old that uh, died after being hit by a car, that one's gonna haunt me for a while. The 17-year-old uh, that was hit by a car on a bicycle, uh, that one will haunt me for the rest of my life. That, you know, these are cases that are very, very bad um, that we all unfortunately deal with and you have to find a way to kind of move on and process that and uh, take care of the next patient in front of you. But having said all that, it is very fun, it is very cool, and uh, we do some weird, crazy things that uh, very few other people have the privilege of doing. Um, so if you're interested, these are the locations of all the critical care fellowships in the country. This data is actually a little old because we have one here now. Uh, and if you're interested, please feel free to reach out. We can get you set up and uh, talk more about how to do a fellowship. Um, but essentially, the way this used to work was you did a neurology residency, uh, you did your two-year fellowship, and you learned how to manage ventilators and kind of do other stuff, and uh, you get to live that sweet attending life. Um, the neurosurgeons uh, do a year, which you can actually enfold into your uh, residency, and uh, are now dual trained when they graduate. Um, and about 
15 or so years ago, uh, a couple of enterprising uh, EM docs at Cincinnati went to Dr. Shutter, who was the uh, director of the neurocritical care unit there. She's now at Pittsburgh, but they wanted to do this, and she wisely and thankfully recognized that EM docs are resuscitation experts. We are critical care experts, and there's no reason why we can't learn the neuromedicine required to take care of these patients. Uh, and so now this is an option for you as well. You do your two-year fellowship after your EM residency, and then you get to have some fun. Um, if you have a broader interest, you're also able to do a critical care fellowship uh, other than neurocritical care, and uh, then you only have to do the neuro part of it after, because assuming you know how to do the rest of the critical care. Uh, and so some, some final thoughts, uh, and please feel free to uh, ask questions, reach out, et cetera. But neurocritical care is critical care. Um, we're not critical care light. We're not stroke docs. We're not neurologists who intubate. Hi, I'm not a neurologist, not even close. Uh, but we are intensivists who take care of really sick, critically ill patients. Um, we have a very unique patient population, and they have some very unique physiology that you don't often see in medicine. We're the only unit in the hospital that will take someone with a blood pressure of 140 over 80 and put them on 30 of levofed and jack their pressures up because we have to. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, it truly is a privilege to take care of our patients. Um, neuroscience in general can is very humbling, and you see how quickly patients can go from awake and talking and being normal to being sort of less than human. Um, neurologic injury can really strip your humanity away from your patients. And so it, it is a privilege to be able to help restore some semblance of normalcy in people's lives. Um, and so if you're interested, please feel free to contact me anytime. Um, we can talk about a fellowship. If you want to come hang out with us on the second floor, um, happy to help arrange that. And uh, I will be happy to take any questions. If you shine the QR code, it auto imports my contact info to your phone, um, or that's it listed there as well. Ah, okay. How do you work up a minor closed head injury with anas query, otherwise normal or exam? Good question, uh, right? Because everyone talks about the people. So uh, depending on the study you read, somewhere between 10 to 20% of the population has physiologic anisocoria just at baseline. Um, and so I don't think there's an ED doc in the world that would not scan that person with a normal neuro exam. But you also want to think about ocular injury, right? So you have uh, other causes for anisocoria. If you have uh, blunt ocular injury, irritoplegia will do that, and it'll be absolutely unilateral. Uh, if you have uh, a carotid dissection and damage to the sympathetic uh, nerves on the carotid sheath, that can cause it. You get a kind of a modified corners. Um, so it's important to do a, a thorough exam and kind of really try to figure out why is their pupil dilated? What else could be going on? And then what are other reasons other than herniation that could cause this, especially in someone who's awake and talking, right? Because you don't expect to see, if, if you really have that much of a high ICP, where you're compressing the third nerve and causing pupillary dilation, that person's not going to be awake and talking to you. That would be very unusual. So there's usually some other explanation for it. And yes, absolutely, I do. Um, the question is, do you advocate the use of uh, pulse dose pressure, peri-intubation to avoid transient hypotension? 100%. Have that neo stick available, have that epi stick available. Um, depending on the institution you're at, uh, you may be able to just pull pressors and start running levofed while you're uh, intubating. Absolutely, I have a very low threshold for having uh, push dose pressors with me in case they drop, because as we've all seen, the patients that you expect the, it the least in are the ones who tank their blood pressures and get super hypoxic. And this is the exactly the wrong patient population to do that in. <laughs> 